Hi everybody. Oops. Hi everybody and welcome to my third of five videos about this, the Pentax KS2. And in this video we're going to look at the menu system and everything which is behind the menu button. This is going to be a long video. These ones always are, especially on these new cameras which have just tons and tons of features. So let's get started. Here's the first tab of the image menu system. Now where you see that camera right up there, that tells you we're in the image menu and there are four tabs within it. Custom image. This allows you to set different JPEG finishes. These different settings will not affect how your raw image turns out if you record raw images. These only affect your JPEG. So what you can do is you can select from each of these different options to affect how your JPEGs will turn out. If you shoot RAW plus JPEG, it affects your JPEG. If you shoot JPEG only, it affects your JPEG. This little hexagon down here tells you a little bit about how the image is going to be finished. So let's take a look at what this is saying. There's a gray hexagon within a larger hexagon. That gray hexagon indicates neutral or flat. So with bright, what this is telling you is there's a little bit more yellow, a little bit more blue, a tiny amount more red, but green, cyan, and magenta are unchanged. So the bright is good for if you have bright light. Now if you have some, uh, if you want to adjust the settings, you can do that too. You can adjust your image saturation by increasing it. It keeps the, the, the parameter and the ratio the same, but increases the saturation or decreases it for that matter. You can change your hue, which rotates the wheel a little bit. And when it's green, it tells you that's, how, that's normal. When it's yellow, it tells you that's different from normal. But your hue is going to actually shift the color balance of the JPEG that you record. So uh, I tend to suggest avoiding adjusting these parameters too much unless you have a specific creative objective in mind. High key and low key adjust, adjust will change the appearance of whether it is low, mid, or high key. Now a mid, mid key is basically what your cameras are set up to take a picture of where gray appears gray and black appears black. This camera you can see with the lighting here appears gray. So this would be a high key image that you're seeing right now. My fingers are basically white. I mean, they're, they're always white because I'm pale as all get out. But um, at any rate, the um, uh, higher key means that black appears gray, gray appears white. Low key, low key means that gray appears black and white appears gray. Think of it that way. Contrast increases your contrast level. And you can see here also where it's green, that tells you what the default setting is. And if you're at yellow, you're at a non-default setting. Um, so contrast basically just means the blacks appear blacker and the whites appear whiter and the change between black and white is faster. And contrast, increasing and decreasing contrast can have different effects. Um, decreased contrast will make an image appear flat and what that means is that it just looks kind of muddy and washed out and things like the the the, the creases in people's faces or distant mountains just don't appear to have as much space so that's one of the things that contrast controls and then sharpness increases how much uh, sharpening is run through the image by the jpeg processor so these settings maybe a couple others are um, the default settings for all of the different features within this menu that we're looking at. We're going to cancel out of that. Natural is the baseline setting. It's actually kind of curious to me that natural isn't the first option because there's just no, no change from the way it's supposed to look. Um, 
But at any rate, natural is the best option to use for 99% of your shooting unless you have a specific look that you're going for. Portrait is good for portraits. It changes some of the parameters here to give people a more pleasant look in uh, the images that you're taking. Landscape is good for landscapes. And again, you can see it changes the parameters here. And if we go into here, it changes some of those parameters on the left as well. But um, in general, landscape is good for landscapes if you want to have your greens and blues pop a little bit more than um, some of the, the other colors which aren't as prevalent in a landscape image. Vibrant and just, this is where things start to get crazy with this hexagon, like, okay, landscape, great, greens and blues are gonna pop, and whoa, what is all that about? So, Vibrant makes your images really, really vibrant. The colors start really to become unnatural here in how colorful they are. Radiant, <laughs> similar, things sort of look like they kind of glow, like they radiate, not like they've been hanging, not radiant, like radiating, like they've been hanging out in Chernobyl for 15 years, but radiant just as in having bright, radiant colors. For muted, muted basically reigns in the colors. So it's sort of like your reds are less red, more gray. Your blues are less blue, more gray. And you can see the green, the green hexagon has moved inside of the gray hexagon. And the, the closer you get to the center, the closer you are to black and white. Bleach Bypass is just kind of crazy. Uh, what Bleach Bypass does is simulate a, a film photographic technique called, amazingly, Bleach Bypass. This next one's reversal film. This is actually my favorite JPEG mode. And when I shoot, uh, I basically leave it in reversal film all the time. I think that this color mode makes the colors look very nice. It increases the contrast. Uh, oops. It increases the contrast a, a bit. You can't control anything in it but sharpness. With, I actually like to, um, to increase the sharpness as much as I can. With, uh, with reversal mode because it just makes some of the details a little bit finer. Um, but uh, the colors that Pentax's reversal film mode imbue into a JPEG are simply fantastic. The darks really take on some nice characteristics and all of the colors just really work nicely together. Uh, I would say that in most shoot, uh, shooting settings, reversal film is probably going to give you the best JPEG results that you can have in any of these settings. Monochrome is black and white. It's just going to give you uh, black and white images. They are a little bit flat, uh, so if you're going to shoot it in this mode, um, you need to go into post and do a little bit of contrast enhancement. Honestly, for black and white, your best bet is to shoot it in reversal film and then open up your images in a processor like Photoshop or GIMP or one of the others and convert it to black and white where you have control over individual channels and that gives you a lot more creative ability with your black and white images. Cross-processing simulates a 
film technique called, mysteriously, cross-processing. Different films are developed different ways. Black and whites developed in a certain set of chemicals. Color print film, like you would take to Walgreens or CVS or Tesco or whatever, is pr processed in a chemical form, um, process called C41. Reversal film, like this, is processed in a process called E6. So cross-processing in film terms is when you take color film and develop it in slide or reversal film chemistry, or you take reversal film, more, this is the most common, and develop it in slide chemistry. I'm sorry, in color print chemistry. There's also a process called ECN2, which is used for movie films, and it's not uncommon for people to take ECN2 films and process them either as color prints or as black and white, which I do quite a bit of, and that's also cross-processing. Processing color or slide film in black and white is another type of cross-processing, though the results from that are usually not great. The exception being with ECN2, some of them. So cross-processing simulates the strange colors that come out of a cross-processed batch of film. And the results can be interesting, um, and it has some creative capacity. leave this in reversal because that's the one I like the most. Capture settings. Image capture settings allow you to control the type of file that you're going to get from your photo. So your file formats are JPEG, which is JPEG only, and you can see how many images are available on this memory card, which is I believe a 32 gigabyte memory card with some stuff on it, uh, with just JPEG. RAW, DNG, means you're only going to save the RAW file and no JPEG. So that more than cuts the number of images in half because RAW files are a lot larger. RAW plus JPEG, RAW plus DNG, the plus means JPEG. So if you shoot in this mode, you're going to save a RAW file and a JPEG, which is why it drops down from 2100 of JPEG to 950 something to 653. So if you want to have the most creative control and you're comfortable in Photoshop or other RAW editors, you can use a raw DNG and that will um, allow you to save both file types. So if you 
like an image enough to go in and really mess with the raw data to get the most out of it. You can do that, and if you think it's just an okay image or not a keeper, you can always just delete them later. Recorded pixels. This is your image size. Full, the full sensor is 5,472 by 3,646 pixels, or 20 megapixels. Medium, small, and large, and uh, extra small, rather. And what these do is, if you're in JPEG only, it really ups the number of, of images you can take. So let's go back to JPEG only, and we'll see that. Enlarge a full sensor, 2130. 3,500, 6,600, 16,000. So if you want to get the most out of it, this is 1920 by 1280, which is a high resolution computer screen at full size. Um, now there are some drawbacks to this. The main drawback is that your sensor only ever records at 20 megapixels at the large size. So if you're going to record smaller sizes, your, your, your camera's computer is what doing what's called a down sample. So there is one downside to changing your file size in the camera, and that is that your camera does not have as much onboard computing power as any desktop computer does, which means that if it's down sampling, the results are not going to be as good as if you simply down sampled afterwards in, in a, a program on your computer, uh, of which there are many free programs that do that very effectively. Plus, it's also eating up battery time and computing power, though though honestly not all that much, to downsample. So in general, your best bet is just to leave it in large, get the most image resolution that you can, and then spend a few extra minutes in post if you have to, shrinking files that you want to keep. JPEG quality, this is another way to really increase your, your image count. And um, JPEG quality is pretty, pretty important. It, I would find it hard to believe that going less than three stars is ever going to really benefit anyone, um, because when you compress JPEGs, you're going to lose quality. In general, it's a good idea to, to have your images in your camera be the highest quality that you can, because you can always remove quality later in post if you want to upload them online in a smaller f file size. You can't add quality. So, in as much as possible, keep the highest quality settings for your camera. Uh, whenever I load photos online, I downsample them in, in post using Photoshop to 1000 pixels on their longest dimension, which usually makes them about 1000 by 650. Um, I could do that in the camera, but the resolution would, the image quality would not be as good when they're loaded online because the camera can't do that as effectively as a desktop. But it, let's say that we wanted to get the most out of our memory card. So we want to JPEG only, extra small, one star. You could take 57,000 images in that setting if you really wanted to, uh, which is which is really a kind of overkill. That's that's about as many as I take uh, in in six to eight months. So that's that's a lot of files. Now here's the last option here. This is your raw file format. There are two choices, PEF and DNG. Uh, DNG, it def the camera defaults to PEF, which is the Pentax extended format, I think is what it call it's called. And DNG, I forget what that's, that stands for, but, but it's a universal RAW format. Uh, DNG can be recognized by any RAW editor. PEF cannot. You need to have Pentax's free software, I believe, to use PEF. There might be one or more that can recognize it, but Photoshop, for instance, cannot open a PEF file that, I, that I've been able, that I know of. And I have CS6 extended, and my Photoshop cannot open a PEF file. But DNGs work just fine. So one thing you want to do if you're going to shoot RAW is set it to a G DNG file format. Autofocus settings. So here are your three autofocus settings. Your autofocus mode, active area, and assist light. So you have three modes to choose from, AF, A, S, and C. Now, the AF stands for autofocus, automatic, single shot, or servo, 
and continuous. I forget what the S stands for, if it's servo or single shot, uh, and continuous. The A means that the camera is going to choose the best autofocus mode based on the situation. On older Pentaxes, AFA was not a great option, but on the KS2, K3, and their newer bodies, AFA works exceedingly well. Um, I would say that in, a, in 150 shots, give or take, I have one where I feel like AFA isn't doing exactly what I want it to do and giving me, me the results I look for. So AFA is a, a good option and it works ex extremely well on the KS2, so I just leave it in that. And AFA then chooses between S and C. So let's say that you have something coming through your frame here. AFS locks onto, let's say my finger, and then that it locks that autofocus. Now, if the finger moves closer, it's going to get, it's going to stay, it's going to become out of focus because AFS is looking to lock onto a, a target and stay there. AFC takes a little bit longer to focus to to focus between each frame because it tracks the subject as it moves. So if it moves closer or moves further away, AFC will will keep that subject in focus. And AFA allows the camera to choose what's best based on the situation. So if AFS is best, you get a faster frame rate when you have multi-frame shooting. With AFC, you get a slower frame rate, but you get more in focus. And the, the Pentax just recognizes situations to know what to do. AF Active Area, now your, your Pentax KS2 has 11 AF points, which is more than enough for most anyone, unless you're doing professional sports photography, um, really this 11 is absolutely suitable. But if you want, now the 11 is spread out in a pattern over the sensor. But if you want to, to center it so that just your central five autofocus points are uh, receiving focus, or are providing focus confirmation, you can do that. Now this is really good if you want to Let's say, you know, this is the mode that I used a few weeks ago when I was photographing a Kung Fu tournament. I knew that I wanted to have the subject centrally framed just to make my life easier, so I didn't want to have all 11 autofocus points causing the camera to accidentally autofocus on the people in the back row. So by setting it to 5, I was able to keep the, the, the Kung Fu, the people who were sparring, for instance, in the Kung Fu tournament, within that 5 autofocus point area and then the autofocus just focused on them and it allowed the camera then to choose the best action so in some shots like the person the boxing glove would be in focus and in other others the the boxing glove hitting the person's face would be in focus and the camera did a pretty good job of figuring out what to put in focus with that when i tried it with 11 sometimes it thought that the person in the crowd making a crazy ooh face would be a great image but at any rate this allows you to, 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 to change where your camera focuses to give you slightly better and more predictable results. Select means that you can select your uh, autofocus points. So if you want to have just this one over here on the left, let's say, or these three over here on the left be in focus, you can do that. And that setting would be good if you're at a racetrack and there's a rally car or a Formula One car coming around here, gets into the left side of the frame, and then it's going to go down a straightaway. So it gets into focus here, and you can start click, 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 and track the car as it goes down the straightaway because the camera has focused on it when it came into the frame. And the last one is your central autofocus point only is the one that's used for autofocus um, uh, focus determination. Now this is really good if you want to centrally frame everything you're taking a photo of. So. This also allows the camera just to focus on one point and allows you to know exactly where the focus point is going to be. So if you're still learning how to use autofocus, this is a really good option because all you have to do is point the, the, cent the center between the two parentheses in the viewfinder of the, of the image at your subject and focus and that will be in focus. Autofocus assist light is only on or off. This is the autofocus assist light right here. And what it does is if it's dark outside, that turns on to give the camera enough light to be able to autofocus. Um, I usually leave it to on, but if I'm gonna be at a play 
a performance in a museum, something like that, where the light could really be disturbing to other people who are trying to enjoy the event or venue, uh, I'll turn it off and let the camera hunt and peck for a little bit longer. But um, honestly, the KS2, I, I was out taking nighttime photographs of a pier and the autofocus assist light didn't come on. Even though there was very low light, there was still enough light for the uh, KS2 to find focus uh, on the pier. AE metering is uh, your metering type, and that stands for auto exposure metering, but it works for any, whenever you're trying to meter. Whether you're in auto exposure mode, shutter priority, or manual mode, doesn't matter. The, the metering modes are all the same. So green is your matrix metering mode. And what that means is that all 77 segments of the light meter are going to be in use and contributing to determining the best exposure. Center weighted means that only the central area. So imagine that this area right here that I'm drawing with a, a circle on what you're seeing right now represents the center. That means that that contributes the majority of the metering data and that everything outside of that center ring contributes a smaller amount of the metering data. This is really good if you're going to be doing pictures of something where you have a person like at the Kung Fu tournament or when I shoot softball games who's going to be in the center area of the frame and you want to give the light on that person the majority of the sensor uh, of the metering information and weight. Uh, center weighted is pretty good if you're going to generally be composing with your subject in the center. Spot metering is only the very spot center spot of your of your um, of your image is going to be 100% of the metering data. Spot metering is very powerful, but it takes a little while to learn how to use it. Um, spot metering is really good for portraits, especially if you're going to put the person's face in the center of the image, because then the person's face is metered, and not the background or their shirt, especially if they're wearing like a dark suit coat or something like that, that can throw off the meter. So having a spot meter allows you to do some, um, some good metering with your portraits. Spot metering is also good if you, you're in manual mode and you want to adjust your settings and you want to meter off of a specific place. So let's say that I wanted to meter off of this gray up here and have this be the color gray. Then the, I would point my, my spot meter at the gray and it would say, one one twenty fifth of a second f 5.6 so when i took this picture now what's black would be black and what's gray would be gray whereas if right now if i had a spot metering on it might say um something like one fifteenth of a second at f 5.6 because the spot meter wants what's black here to be gray and that's a little bit of why what you're seeing uh, makes this this KS2 look lighter than it actually is. It's really a black camera. Uh, spot metering gives you the ability to meter a part of the scene, figure out what your, your camera settings should be, and then take the image with those settings, or just to meter off the very center of your, your image. Um, like I said, it's very powerful. It takes a little bit of time to learn how to use well, but once you learn how to use it, it can give you some really strong creative control over how you take your pictures. In general, the 77 point um, matrix or averaging meter on the KS2 is exceptionally good. And I had, um, I can think of no times when I had this camera in, in more than 5,000 shots that I've taken with it that I felt like the um, the matrix meter was letting me down. Digital filters, okay. Digital filters are if you want to do an in-camera creative image. So no filter is a good default because it just says the image is going to appear as it, as it should. Extract color allows you to extract colors. And basically what that means is well, I'll tell you what, here's a sample image that I took with extracted color. So 
So when you're extracting a color, this allows you to select which color channel you would like to extract here. And you can also choose a second channel if you would like. And you can control the amount of the scale of the, the removal that you do. So you can basically just, let's say that if you wanted to mute reds. Okay, so you select red, reduce this a little bit, select magenta purple here, reduce it a little bit more, and that'll give you a pretty good chance, uh, a pretty good reduction in red. Now you can also tone the image to give it an overlay going from, from cyan blue to sepia. Replace color says, I want to take right now everything that's red and make it blue. Or I want to take everything that's green, that's green, and make it purple. And here's the amount of that effect that I want to have. So this can give you, this is sort of like a cross-processing or bleach bypass like we saw uh, a few minutes ago in the video. That's sort of the result that you're going to get. Let's say that you have a picture of a tree. You could make those trees green leaves purple, making it look like a color infrared image. So there are some creative select creative abilities you have with these uh, digital filters that, that, it's, uh, that are built into the KS2. Toy camera. Toy camera will make it look like it, the image was taken with a toy camera. The shading level is how much vignetting you're going to have around the image. Whether you want it, oops, whether you want it to be off or up to heavy. The blur is how much image softness you're going to introduce because toy cameras have some significant softness. And your tone break uh, is going to adjust somehow the tonality. Retro is going to give you a retro tone. So you can change it from cyan up to sepia. And you can change your frame to add a frame around your image. High contrast increases your contrast. So you can make some super contrasty images if you want to. Shading allows you to add a vignette, and this is your vignette shape, this top row, and then it also allows you to select how much vignetting that you're going to add of the shape that you've selected in the top row. Invert color, on or off. So this is really useful. Let's say you, you have a, a bunch of old black and white film that your, your dad or your grandpa took and you want to digitize it. Well, you could select your black and white image mode that we saw just a couple minutes ago, select invert color and take pictures of those negatives. And now you'll see those negatives as though they were positives. Now, anytime you use one of these digital filters, it does take some processing time in your camera but um, that's a good way you can do it in your camera just to get an idea of what the images look like to see if there's any that you want to have either printed or professionally digitized uh, on a scanner to get the best results out of.
Unicolor Bold. What this does is this takes one of your color channels and really strengthens it. Bold Monochrome. This makes your, your images monochrome and then makes them bold. I'm going to turn this back to off, but, as you, but uh, you saw the sample images and uh, some of them have some pretty good creative effects. So this last one is HDR capture and it's, uh, it's grayed out, um, but it allows you to turn HDR on and off. All right, so here we are in the second tab of the image, of the, of the, uh, image menu. And this has some more features that allow us to control how the images look. Clarity enhancement, on or off, increases image clarity or sharpness. Um, it has to do with 
how the lens works. You put the lens on the camera, and this works for some lenses, not all, I believe. And the camera knows, oh, it, uh, it's this thing. So here's what I need to do. I tend to just leave it off. Uh, the, the, the types of lenses that, that you're likely to use on these cameras, Pentax lenses are really good. They don't need a whole lot of clarity enhancement. Um, so, so, I mean, it can make an image more clear, but I think, but it also can add some digital noise in, in my opinion. I, I don't think clarity enhancement does a whole lot to benefit images, so I tend to leave it off. Lens correction allows you to insert some corrective parameters for lenses. And again, you're, if you're using a modern Pentax lens, like a DA, DFA, or FA, your camera will know a little bit about that lens when you mount it and will know how much of these things to do. So distortion correction, what this does is lenses, lenses distort light as they come through. And the reason for this is because all of the, the lenses are round. So the light hits the lens and then it, it moves around. Let's say for it, I'll show you a little bit of how this works. Now, when you, when you have your sensor, the actual top left corner of your images is the bottom right and your top, your bottom right is at the top left. So images recorded on the sensor and film are upside down because lenses make them upside down. So let's say that this here represents your image sensor and this here represents your lens. Light comes in the top, it bends around and, and crosses like this. So in the process of bending, your, the lens distorts images somewhat. So distortion correction adjusts how the sensor or how the, ca the camera processes the image to remove distortion. Uh, Pentax lenses really don't distort all that much. Some of them effectively not at all. And on an APS-C size sensor where you're only getting the central part of the image circle from the lens anyway, distortion correction doesn't do give you a whole lot of benefit. In fact, it can make the edges of the image a little bit softer than they need to be. I tend to leave it to off because it also takes a little bit of processing time and drains the battery a little bit to have it on. Peripheral illumination correction. So you can se select auto as well as different, different amounts of correction or leave it off. This is another thing that corrects how lenses work. So again, let's say that this is your lens. The light in the center has a straight line to go through the center of the lens to the image center. The light up here has to bend, and so it has a longer line. It gets a longer distance to travel, diagonal versus, versus straight. So you lose a little bit of light on the edges. Wide angle lenses especially lose more light. It's not as noticeable with an APS-C camera as it is with a medium or especially a large format camera but there can be a little bit of light loss. Well, there's, there's always light loss around the edges with every lens. And that's just part and parcel to it. Um, so what this does is this allows the camera to correct for that by automatically detecting whether or not there is light loss around the periphery of the image. I tend to leave it off. Um, telephoto lenses also really suffer from, from light loss like, like wide angles do. Uh, I actually find a little bit of light drop off on the edges can be a nice image element. Uh, it draws focus to the center of the image, for instance. So you can turn it to auto if you want to have your images be a little bit more balanced, but it, again, it takes up processing power, power. It takes a little bit of time to proce process and it eats up battery a little bit faster. So I tend to leave it off because most lenses, that's just not going to be an issue. Lateral chromatic aberration adjustment on and off. So what this does is some lenses do what's called purple or green fringing, which is where when you have something black suddenly go to something white, let's say, you'll find that on the white surface there's either a purple fringe or a green fringe, okay? And the reason for that is because of the way light moves through lenses and how image sensors see that. Purple and green fringing don't happen on film because sensors see and record light in a different way than film does. So this is something that Pentax added to correct for purple 
and green fringing in lenses. Basically, it has to do with light waves, green, uh, red, green, and blue, uh, focusing at different points when they come through a lens. And so, so blue light focuses is slightly blurry when green is in focus, and green is slightly blurry when blue is in focus, and that's what causes the, the fringing colors. Same thing, red is at a slightly different focus point than both of them. So this corrects it by finding the fringing and removing it. But again, it takes added processing time and processing power. Um, and most of the Pentax lenses don't really fringe that badly. And when they do, they only fringe really wide open, uh, meaning at F, you know, at whatever the largest aperture is. When you stop down a couple of stops, they tend not to fringe anymore. Most of them, not all. Diffraction correction. So diffraction is what happens when your images get soft because your depth of field is too great. As you stop down the aperture on your lens, you know, the, the opening gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, when, a, when light has a very small opening to pass through, it starts to do some very strange things like go out of focus. So on lenses, most lenses, once you stop down but below f11, you start to get what's called diffraction softening, where even though there should be more in focus, what's in focus is slightly softer. It's very noticeable at f16 uh, in some lenses, and it's extremely noticeable at f22 and beyond in all lenses. Um, especially on APS-C, beyond f11, you'll, you'll start to see diffraction softening. Uh, so what, what this does is this, this, this adds added sharpening to remove some of that softening. Again, it's again using processing power in your camera. Uh, your best way to avoid diffraction softening is simply not to use really small apertures. Um, really beyond f11, there's not a ton of benefit with most lenses. At any rate, so if you leave it on, it will run some algorithms to, to sharpen areas that are softened by diffraction, but again, you don't have as much processing power in your camera, and you're using processing time and battery life to do in-camera in sharpening. Your best bet is just to try to avoid, it for most applications, going much beyond f11, and then diffraction softening won't be an issue for you. Dynamic range settings. So you have two options here, highlight correction, on, off, and auto, and shadow correction auto and then three levels. Now what this does, highlight correction says, hey, here's this highlight area, like this part right up here. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to run some algorithms to reduce the brightness here and try to restore some of this detail. Shadow does the same thing. Hey, here's this really dark area down here. I'm gonna run some algorithms to make this less of a shadow and restore some of the detail. That actually, running these can make your images look flat and remove some of the some of the visual interest from them but moreover it can add digital noise because you're again processing in the camera with less processing power than a computer and um, you're taking up battery life and processing time the best bet for this if you're if you're having a problem with highlights and shadows the best thing to do is shoot in raw as well as jpeg and then in the raw file with a desktop computer, you can correct significantly more shadow and highlight um, data loss than you can in the camera without adding digital noise. So, so those are okay if you're shooting high contrast settings and you only want to shoot JPEGs, but remember they're going to eat up your battery life and slow down your shooting time. High ISO noise reduction. It's auto, low, medium, high, and custom. Auto means the camera just decides whether or not. So what this means is that when you're at a high ISO, say 1600 or 25, six, something like that, the camera will run algorithms to remove the, the noise that comes about when shooting at a high ISO. That increases image softness, however. So um, you lose some, some image quality when you do this. Auto just means that the camera's going to do it when it feels like it needs to. 
Low is it's going to run it all the time at high ISOs, but just without much correction, a little bit more correction on medium and a lot of correction at, on high. I set this up for custom and I usually keep it on custom because I don't go into high ISOs all that often, but when I do, I want some noise reduction. And this is something that's definitely worth doing. And custom allows you to add noise reduction at user-defined levels for each ISO setting, and that's in a later menu that we'll get to later. In, oh, or, no, it's right here, I'm sorry. Um, it's in the setting menu. And so what you do is you go into your settings and then you can say at ISOs 100 to 160, or 200 to 320, in this case, I want it off. I don't want any noise reduction in these because these are low ISOs and the camera can handle creating the image just fine. Now, one thing to bear in mind is the KS2 has a sensor which is a native 200 ISO sensitivity. So anytime you go beyond 200 ISO, it has to run an algorithm to compensate for not getting enough light. It's basically like pushing film if you've ever tried that. In this case, it's running an algorithm to compensate for getting too much light. Um, theoretically, you could get noise in both of those, but really in this range with the KS2, there's zero discernible noise. Even at 400 to 640, there's basically no noise that I could discern, but just as a matter of course, I tend to like having low for 400 through 1250. Then medium for the next two works pretty well, in my opinion and then high for anything beyond that. And to get to the next set, you just rotate the command wheel here and it takes you up to the ultra high ISO settings. Now bear in mind, these are not really great for shooting. I use 51200 when I'm doing overnight shots and I, I can't look through the viewfinder because it's too dark to frame an image. And I don't want to wait for a 400 second exposure to be taken to find out if I framed it right. So I'll go up to 51200, take a three second image, and even though it's really low quality, I can tell whether or not I have the tripod set up correctly to take the image I wanna take. That's what some of these things are used for. They're not really meant to be used for shooting on a regular basis. So those are your, that's your noise reduction. I'm gonna go back. So this is your setting and then you can select, and that's what happens when you do custom. At off, it just, goes to off. Now the settings button, I believe, yes, it only appears when you have it set to custom and then you can get into the settings menu. Slow shutter speed noise reduction. I leave this to off all the time. What this does is if you have a long shutter speed, let's say a second or five or 20 seconds or longer if you're in bulb mode, it takes two images. The first image to create the image and then a second identical image to find where there's digital noise because you get digital noise when you have a long exposure. That's what noise reduction on does. Noise reduction auto allows the camera to determine whether or not there's digital noise in the image and, and if it needs to take a second image, it will. I tend not to do that because noise on long exposures is not as dramatic as it is when you take a high ISO image. And in fact, on this camera, I was taking 400 and 500 second exposures overnight with it and saw zero digital noise. So honestly, if you leave this to off, you're going to be in pretty good shape and you won't be caught off guard when your camera goes to take a second image and you're not expecting it to. GPS, Astro Tracer. This is now, if you have the OGPS unit, this allows you to use an Astro Tracer and there are some sample images taken with this camera using the Astro Tracer. Now I will say that the Astro Tracer and this camera are not a match made in heaven. The Astro Tracer relies on a camera having a significant amount of in-camera shake reduction, like the K3 has four and a half stops. This has three and a half stops. I found that the Astro Tracer on this camera was good for up to about 30 to 40 second exposures of stars. By comparison, in the K3, it's good for north of two and a half to three minutes in some settings. I really struggled to get the Astro Tracer to work well with this camera, but I did have a handful of successes. Um, so the Astro Tracer is a little device that clips onto the top on your hot shoe. And what you can do is you can select your action in bulb mode. The Astro Tracer only works in bulb, and you can either tell it to disable the Astro Tracer or enable the, the Astro Tracer. 
you can have it be a timed exposure or not. Timed means you click the button once, it takes the whole exposure and then it closes. This means that it would be basically a bulb, so you can set it to 25 seconds instead of 20 or 30. And then you can adjust your exposure time up to as high as 5 minutes or as low as 10 seconds. GPS LED indicators. There is a bright blue LED on the back of the Astro Tracer and um, constantly thought I was getting weird weird lights out of the corners of my eyes when, I, when the, uh, when the uh, Astro Tracer was going and I was doing something else elsewhere on the beach and uh, I'd see this blue flash and I'd go, what, what, what is that? What is that? And uh, so at any rate, you can turn them on or off. It's also a good idea to turn it off at night if you don't want to risk the blue light. If you have another camera, that the blue light could could pollute that image with it with blue light from the LED. So I left it on. Um, you know, I should have turned it off. But at any rate, if you wanted to turn, if you have the Astro Tracer and want to turn it off, that's where you do it. Uh, let's see calibration. When you have the Astro Tracer turned on, you have to calibrate the sensors in it the gyroscopes and so if you have the Astro Tracer on your camera the calibration will light up and then you can go into the calibration menu and, and manually calibrate your, your Astro Tracer which requires that you spin the camera around in a few different directions um, a, a couple of times or at least one you know at least once to, uh, to get the best calibration. GPS time sync syncs up the time on the image in the exif data with the GPS satellites instead of whatever's in your camera. So let's say you travel to another time zone to take overnight photos of stars. This will allow the EXIF in the image to be correct uh, without having to manually change the settings for time in your camera.